Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm honored to be with you here this morning. My name is uh, Lara Habib, and I present business news on Al Arabiya News Channel. Just a quick note on today's uh, session. It's in Arabic. It's televised. Uh, you can have a simultaneous translation on your devices. Kindly put your uh, phones on silent mode. And we shall begin by seeing this video. You say, well, what harm could a deep intelligence in the network do? So, well, I could start a war. The rise of powerfully, I will be either the best or the worst thing ever to happen to humanity. We do not yet know which. The fourth industrial revolution continues to open new possibilities, but alongside these benefits, we must address the disruption of labor markets, the weaponization of artificial intelligence. We're also using new technology, including AI, to remove fake accounts that are responsible for much of the false news. development of smart technologies to analyze great quantities of data quickly and with a higher degree of accuracy opens up a whole new field of medical research and gives us a new weapon in our armory in the fight against disease. AI is a rare case where I think we need to be proactive in regulation instead of reactive um, because I think by the time we are reactive in AI regulation it's too late. Dear audience, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, at this session that is held by Al Arabiya at the occasion of the World Economic Forum on the Middle East and North Africa related to the fourth industrial revolution in the Arab world, its challenges as well as its um, opportunities. We do not want to be pessimistic based on the screen video. However, undoubtedly, the new technologies such as robotics as well as AI and the Internet of Things are definitely introducing major changes in how we can develop the economic value and how it's actually showcased. And the distributed in this society. However, this is actually threatening the jobs, the opportunities, and the safety of individuals. So what are the best policies that need to be implemented by um, governments in adopting this technology and this uh, um, technicalities, and how would they actually protect the welfare and the benefits of their um, uh, people? So we will have as well Wafa bin Hassin, Council of the Middle East and North Africa Access Now. You are actually the chair of the um, company in the MENA region, uh, in addition to um, Omar bin Sultan al-Ulama, His Excellency the Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence in the UAE, a first in the world. We have as well Murad Sonmez, the Managing Director of um, uh, the and uh, the uh, Head of the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution at the Global Economic Forum, and we have as well Mudassar Sheikha, who is actually a success story, and Mr. Khalid Arumahi, Chief Executive at the Bahrain Economic Development Board. Uh, I shall start, I will be gender biased, and I'm starting with Wafa. Definitely, the fourth industrial revolution is focused mainly on the big data. Governments are compiling information about the people, and they are providing, by means of this information, social solutions and most probably security solutions. However, at the same time, they could be breaching the confidentiality or the privacy of the information available to the people. So how can we strike a balance? Thank you very much for having me on this panel. A very crucial question indeed. I believe that the Arab world has a huge technology that benefits from its strengths. And uh, our population today is predominantly under the age of 24. Uh, that population is tech savvy. They're often very well connected. Uh, lots of startups. And they, have, they bring us the hope to build new technologies that do respect privacy and that respect human rights. And what does that mean? It means that um, policies that are implemented by governments, both in terms of supporting, for example, economic ecosystems, uh, but also in terms of providing government services through using machine learning, for example, uh, or using e-government services generally with open data, that all of these policies 
uh, start with a user-centered framework. It means that the user is at the heart of all of these frameworks. It means that the user has the right to not only own their data, because it's an extension of themselves, really, but also the capacity to uh, amend that data, rectify that data, uh, have interoperability to use that data where they would like, and also to be free from, uh, from surveillance, from uh, censorship, from all of these uh, problems quite often that do face this region. And so having user-centered policies that really take the user to put them in the center and the heart of everything. That's what it means to have a more responsible type of technology. And I, I truly believe it's critical for us to, to, to know this as the Arab world. We, we have a, it's a very nuanced situation, but we are at an advantage because again, our population is young, uh, we're, we're, we're right at the helm of these new technologies. So I, I am very optimistic for that. Uh, Excellency Minister, you had mentioned that the big data is a source of wealth for the governments of the future. What are the UAE doing in order to improve the life of its inhabitants and what are the plans ahead and how does it actually protect the privacy and the confidentiality of the people? Thank you, Lara. I shall speak in English in order to actually fit in the flow of the discussion um, of the speakers in this session. In general, the biggest challenge that we see as governments and as individuals is we assume that if we collect data, it's going to make us richer, it's going to make us be better, and that we'll be able to create a better future. But that is a misleading statement, I think. If we do not understand the quality of the data, if we don't understand how to use them, and if we don't categorize this data in a way that allows us to be able to compute it in the right manner and to develop uh, the right policies uh, in place. So I think, and I mentioned this in a session yesterday, I think what's important is the quality of data. So if you have quality big data, you have, I'd say, the wealth that you would assume. If you have big data in general, it could be garbage at the end of the day. So it's very important for us to differentiate that. What the UAE is doing is we understand that in the race when it comes to artificial intelligence, we need to be proactive. Like Elon Musk said in that video, it's very important for us not to react to what's happening because historically in the development of technology, we've always developed technologies, things have gone wrong, and then we've put policies as governments. With the fourth industrial revolution, because of the size of impact that it's going to have on many different fronts of our lives, we need to start putting policies, we need to start being agile with this technology from today. So what we've done so far, we've launched a reg lab in the UAE to test regulations and policies on six month basis across the whole country, which allows us to test the technology, test the policy, see the impact, and then determine if we want to really change the legislation process in the UAE to be more uh, welcoming or to be more, let's say, restrictive for that technology. We're also developing a lot of incentives for AI companies, developing a lot of incentives for data centers to move to the UAE. And we understand 100% that the new industrial revolution is focused on two things. It's on quality data and on compute. If we have the ecosystem that gives these two things to any company that work, wants to work in that space, we are going to become the leaders. And finally, uh, I believe that not one country is going to lead in the fourth industrial revolution. The difference between all industrial revolutions and the fourth industrial revolution is it's so wide. There are so many technologies, there are so many moving parts, that there are going to be hubs of excellence across the world. And each hub is going to champion one domain or two domains. And we want to champion the domain of government first and foremost, and then be the platform. We want to become government as a platform for any fourth industrial revolution uh, effort in the UAE. We shall resume regarding how to deal with the data that's compiled with the, by the private sector. Murad, I would like to hear from you. If we take the example of um, a biometric ID, for example, uh, I believe that in India, for example, we have, uh, uh, there has been a compilation of the information related to one billion persons. We're talking about, um, um, we're talking about uh, prints, our fingerprints, we're talking about um, um, banking data. Is it, um, is it actually safe to have all this information, to compile all this information, especially for a region that is usually subjected and at the receiving end of electronic uh, attacks? Not just limited to biometric, but you can add genetics to the mix. 
Um, I think uh, there are ways to protect the privacy of individuals while making sure that we take advantage of the enormous potential we have uh, with machine learning algorithms. And I agree with uh, Afa that we need to take a human-centered approach and look at the positive impact and negative and maximize the positive and ideally eliminate, if not uh, minimize, the uh, negatives. And in terms of data policy, our approach, the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Network, is to separate or decouple, as we say in uh, technical terms, who owns the data, what you can do with it, and who gets rewarded. And there are mechanisms to keep the data where it's collected so you don't have to put everything in one place. That makes it harder to hack. But assign also the rights uh, for the data by the individuals, by the owners. And what makes it more interesting is uh, we have 8 billion people, close to 8 billion people on the planet, but we have 20 billion things providing data. And in the future, we'll have 100 billions of these things providing data. So <coughs> we need a secure framework, flexible framework that allows us to use the data from the things and the people in an effective and useful manner. And there's, again, technical ways to approach that. And in our network, we're working with several governments, uh, including Bahrain and the UAE, to address that in an agile manner. And uh, I agree with uh, Omar that we don't have much time to figure out, so we need to get going and do and learn and iterate. Uh, I would love to hear from the private sector, especially that Karim has been subjected to an electronic assault and the information of around 14 million clients have been breached. What can guarantee for the clients of Karim currently that this will not happen again? And what about the internal systems? Do they actually protect the information of your clients um, from, for example, the employees, um, because of course uh, some um, uh, some threats have been raised in the West regarding that there is no system that could protect the information of clients when it comes uh, to their journeys um, and that this information could be misused. So thank you uh, uh, for the question. Let me put the, this, this panel, at least from my perspective, in context. Um, and the context that I see is we have a region that has, depending on how you define the region, 400 to 600 million people. We have a region that has largely missed out on a lot of the infrastructure development that happened in the developed world. So the quality of life that we have given our people is not at the same level as Europe or the US or other parts of the developed world did. We have massive unemployment. We have crumbling infrastructure. Um, we really have a lot of catch up to do. So in that context, the way that I view the fourth industrial revolution is an opportunity for us to leapfrog into the digital future. And this is our opportunity to actually build that infrastructure, build the systems that took some of the developed world decades and decades to build. And we can do it much faster. If you look at the example of Kareem and ride hailing in general, we have been able to build a transportation infrastructure that would have traditionally cost billions and billions of dollars at a fraction of the cost and it's actually being done in a crowd-funded way by individuals buying cars and vehicles and putting onto our platform. And that's actually been done not by reducing jobs, but by actually creating a lot of jobs. So technology a lot of times gets uh, known for killing jobs and automation seems like a bad word. But in this case, and there are examples uh, outside of Kareem as well, where platforms like Kareem have actually created a lot of jobs and created infrastructure that wasn't there before. So I view the fourth industrial revolution as our opportunity to catch up, as our opportunity to leapfrog and actually get to parity uh, with the rest of the world. Now, in, in that context, um, now, of course, technology doesn't come without challenges. Uh, some of the challenges that you mentioned around privacy, around cybersecurity, are, are real challenges that we have to contend with. And we, as the developers and custodians of these platforms, have a responsibility to make sure that these things are top of mind uh, for us. But uh, I just want to make sure that in the, in, the, in the amount of effort and work that needs to be done to pull our people out of poverty and give them a certain quality of life, these, uh, these challenges don't become stumbling blocks. They become as challenges that we work together to resolve, that we put the right regulations in place. But we really uh, work together to overcome these challenges and really focus on leapfrogging our region into the digital future. Thank you so much, uh, Khalid. Uh, Bahrain. Khalid, Bahrain is trying 
to becoming a hub for the data centers. And a law has been enacted recently regarding the confidentiality of the, of the data. Could you please um, talk to us about it? Is it actually similar to the GDPR, the European GDPR? Thank you. In the name of God, most gracious, most um, merciful, in order to fit in the um, to fit in with the other speakers, I can speak in English. No, no, no. I had already agreed that, that with the minister, we will be sharing the same language, though the anchor person has asked him to speak in Arabic because it's broadcasted live on Al Arabiya. And the data protection law was not modeled on the GDPR. It was modeled on uh, the EU directive that it was issued in 2005. Um, and so we think that as we look to enter into uh, the knowledge economy, we have to understand how we protect customer data. Um, we think the GDPR is a great law, but we wanted to go stick with the 2005 directive. And frankly, we're now compelling institutions to comply with that law. Uh, the banks, um, anybody that is collecting customer data has to comply with that law. So we built it on the 2005 directive. But I want to address, uh, as we look at the fourth industrial revolution, if we're going to be serious about, as a region, tapping into this opportunity, then data has to be protecting data, allowing data to be analyzed, distributing that data is going to be at the key of our strategy. Uh, I'm going to steal a quote that Murat mentioned that I heard him say yesterday, which I loved. If data is the new oil, then China is the new Saudi Arabia. Because they have that scale as a country to be able to mine that data in a way that no other region in the world probably can. So if the Middle East is going to have some critical mass, then we have to do a several things. One is we have to have the refinery in our region. And we went out to the world and said, why is Google, Amazon, Microsoft, not setting up sales offices, but actually having that data center, that hyperscale data center in our region? And with Amazon, we were successful. They're going to build a hyperscale data center, three data centers in Bahrain. It's going to be launched this summer. Um, so we think that is a building block, not for Bahrain, but for the entire Middle East. The second element is how do we ensure that we're not hyper-protective over our data in countries and not allowing that scale that China has? We can't reach that scale, but how do we allow pooling of data? Because you're going to need genetic, traffic, health information of the Middle East at scale to allow it to be relevant statistically. And so we introduced a data jurisdiction law, the first in the world, which says to corporates and to governments, if you store your data in Bahrain, it can be governed by the laws of your country. And we think that is going to be a groundbreaking law. Uh, one of the Arab countries, I'm not sure I can mention their name, has already signed up to store their data in Bahrain. And we hope, again, this will proliferate otherwise. So if we don't have the refinery, if we don't have that pooling of data, then how are we going to have a statistically relevant information in the Middle East? So uh, we, have, we take this situation or we take this opportunity very seriously while not neglecting protecting customer data. We have conducted a survey on Twitter and we asked the people, do you trust that the governments or that the private companies are capable of protecting the information that they are compiling? Let's look at the results. So let's look at the results of the survey. So the highest percentage was clearly no, 64%. They do not trust that the companies or that the um, governments are capable of protecting their um, data from abuse or from piracy. And I believe that this is due to uh, many of the scandals that we have witnessed recently, including, of course, uh, the Cambridge Analytica. And here is a question. To what extent would a law similar to the GDPR are enough and sufficient to protect um, the information of the user, of the private sector user? And shall we take additional measures, uh, such as, for example, the claims that we have uh, uh, received from an American senator um, asking for the uh, incrimination of the CEOs of private sector companies, the ones who are uh, actually breaching um, the confidentiality of the information of their uh, clients? Really good start in protecting user data and customer data. Uh, but I do think that um, 
countries are trying to figure out in different ways. And so while the European Union has a GDPR now, it does have an extraterritoriality element to it where other countries may have to also comply with that regulation just because the data that they're treating belongs to residents of the EU. And so um, it's certainly a great start. And the way I see it is that um, it's, it's a race to the top. If other countries can have similar laws to the GDPR, that would be great. Um, obviously, I, I don't think I would call for, for jailing top executives. I, I think that's, that's really missing the point. Uh, I think there's a, a, a wide range of policies that could be implemented, not just by the social media platforms themselves, but also by the governments, and such as the United States, that host these companies. And so, um, and, and you mentioned earlier something about biometric ID and digital identity. Um, that's an, an, an even added, a more, a, I would say, grave layer to all of this. Um, when we talk about data uh, that was pulled on uh, in the survey that you just mentioned, uh, I'm sure they mean probably your personal data on, on websites. But uh, when you talk about digital identity here, we're talking about biometric information, uh, information that a user is unable to, to, to change with your biometric ID or your iris, uh, with your biometric uh, thumbprint or iris, and so, and a plethora of other types of uh, biometric information. And so this, I mean, to have a connected city, to have a hyper-connected world, to have services be delivered efficiently, and to, uh, to be inclusive in public services, sure, digital identity is great, but it just makes the, 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 the necessity of having uh, appropriate uh, cybersecurity infrastructure, data privacy regulation, all the more important. And um, as you mentioned, we, we saw it in Aadhaar in India, uh, where uh, I think, I believe you, someone can buy the personal data of millions of Indians for 10 to $12 on WhatsApp. I mean, exactly. so we see these examples uh, quite often, and, I, and, I, and it's imperative that we're, we're very, very aware of that, um, and that we don't just move fast and break things. We have to move well and, and build things well. And uh, now is obviously not the time to break things. It's time to, to build and to build it properly. Excellency, I will be listening to the opinion of the internet companies. Some say that in the Arab countries there are several challenges and obstacles to the work of these companies because there are laws on electronic crimes which are actually making their life difficult and which would mean constricting the activity of some companies. And this is related, of course, to some security issues. And this is not applicable in other countries. So what do you have to say about this? Well, question. I'd just like to reiterate a point that Wafa said. Uh, with regards to data first, and then answer this question. The biggest challenge that we see right now is that most money is made through data collection. So there's a lot of investment, billions of dollars going from these private sector companies into data collection systems that allow them to collect data, sensitive data of you know, uh, many people across the world. But there's no incentive for them to invest as much in protecting the data. So that's why we're seeing the breaches, we're seeing all of the issues that are happening. And that is multiplied across different companies and across different governments as well uh, globally. So I think the new revolution should be a revolution of if you're going to collect it, you need to be responsible enough to store it and to invest in storing it in the right way. With regards to the private sector, I would jump out on a limb and, and here and say the private sector is great. I think what they're doing uh, in this space is incredible. But we need to also try to understand what are the cultural norms in certain countries, what are the concerns that certain governments have, and not treat the whole world as a one-size-fits-all and as unpainted in a, in a very wide brush. And the, the difference is that today the internet crosses borders, and governments try to be open, they try to work with these platforms. So we as the UAE, for example, every single time a company does something that might not fit 100% with our outlook for the future, we come and we sit with them on the table. We've done that with Uber in the past, and uh, that uh, was, was actually one of the success stories of coming and sitting with the government, understanding the challenges, and working around it with a solution that today proves to be better than the initial solution that certain companies had in mind. I believe that in the future, we need to be agnostic of the concerns of government. We need to work together because Governments exist to serve people. Governments exist to ensure that the future is better than what it is today. The private sector, in some circumstances, focuses on economic return. 
how much money can we make out of this platform or out of the solution? If it conflicts with my view on the future of my society, it's a challenge that we need to address. And the only way to do it is to work together. The final thing I'd like to say is the motive for the private sector and the motive for government should be aligned. We need to develop all technologies responsibly. So the call that we make out of the UAE is we need to be responsible in developing technology, even in AI. The motto that His Highness Sheikh Mohammed gave to me when uh, he appointed me as Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence is you need to build a responsible artificial intelligence nation. So my guiding star is this, responsible development. And we're trying to do this on all technological uh, developments, on all technology, technological deployments. And that's the call that I would actually say for all private sector companies. Murat, uh, Murat, please, can you please brief me on this? How could you actually compare between the laws for um, uh, uh, cyber crimes in the Arab countries in comparison with the rest of the world? Uh, I, I think it's important for us to be not punitive in terms of uh, regulatory frameworks, but enabling. I'll give you one example. Uh, one of the Middle East countries' uh, chief scientist told me that his daughter is a cancer researcher in Massachusetts. She developed a blood test to detect pancreatic cancer long before the symptoms kick in. And it's, as you may know, it's one of the deadliest forms of cancer. She needed data from nearby hospitals across the street. She could see the data, she could touch the data, but she could not use the data because of existing privacy laws. So while it's important to protect the privacy of the individuals, we need to make sure that we don't get in the way of the potential. And if you look at Japan, it's a declining population, peaked at 125 million, 4 million people with dementia. It will double in the next 10 to 20 years. Most countries will face the same situation, and it will cripple the Japanese economy. So we need to combine data on environment, lifestyle, genetics, hospitalization, clinical trials, and vitals in order for us to accelerate the cure and provide a proper living condition. And also for countries where we don't have the skills, AI and machine learning algorithms can fill the skill gap while we're training our people. In developed countries where we have a productivity issue, they can help improve the productivity. So I think we need to be potential oriented as opposed to uh, while considering the threats. And I agree with Omar that um, we cannot expect consensus. I mean, those days are unfortunately over. But we can look for interoperability. And we can take a regional approach. And that's what we're seeing in the Middle East, in ASEAN, in Japan, and India, as we work with several governments and private sector companies and entrepreneurs and civil society leaders. Everybody agrees that we need to be forward-looking, opportunity for the citizens oriented, mindful of the threats, and, uh, and there are technologies that reduces the risk. For example, edge computing and blockchain. I'm not talking about cryptocurrency, about the architecture. And uh, there is huge potential with these technologies. And as we iterate through different governments, partnerships, uh, I think uh, we'll find the right balance. Let's now move to another challenge, which is very important when, we, when it comes to the fourth um, um, industrial uh, revolution, which is related to the security threats. Looking at uh, the um, sector of transportation, uh, there have been uh, many um, developments. We have drones that can be used for logistics and that can be used as well in wars. Um, we currently have many drones that are being used. Uh, we have as well the um, unmanned um, uh, chars. We have as well deadly robots. Um, and um, the UN is currently looking um, at uh, this issue and it's standing against uh, all this which is uh, actually opposed by uh, some of the great um, powers such as for example the US. Do you believe that uh, these have to be prohibited to start with? So, <clears throat> so at, you know at, at most startups uh, including Kareem we believe in this methodology called Agile and um, the core belief in Agile is that you don't know what the future holds. You don't know what customers will like and customers will not like. So the best way to sort of build a product in this, in this environment is to build what they call a minimal viable product, launch it, and learn, and iterate, learn, and iterate, learn, and iterate. And, and I would say that with a lot of these technologies, um, it's going to be very, very similar. You know, technology can be a force for good, but technology can also be used in a, in a, in a, in a destructive way. And, and the applications of these technologies could be very different in our region compared to other parts of the world because some of the infrastructure challenges are, are different. So, so my view on this would be let, let's not prohibit any technology from coming in 
uh, and let's have people start um, solving some of our problems, genuine problems with this technology, but take a very close monetary approach, monitoring approach to the applications. And as and when we see technology starting to being used for things that are destructive, that's when we intervene. Uh, if we start blocking technology uh, at the outset, we actually might miss out on the many positive aspects of, um, of, uh, of technology. But can we control killer robots? Have you watched Terminator? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's always a risk, right? Uh, and I think for the, sake of, um, uh, for the sake of our people, for the sake of development, we'll have to take some risk, right? Because if we don't take any risk, then we risk uh, leaving large percentages of our population in, in poverty. And maybe just want to make one point on the, on the point of responsibility. I really like what, uh, what Omar said. I think as people that develop technology, we all need to own up to um, making sure that technology is being used in a responsible way. It's not enough to say that, look, we have built this ride-hailing platform, you know, we'll match a customer with a captain, and then whatever happens in the car is not our problem. We are simply a matchmaking platform. And um, I think more and more, and we're seeing this with companies like Facebook and others, where as people that develop technology, we need to make sure that the technology is being used in a responsible way. We need to ensure the safety of the people taking rides with us in the same way that uh, Facebook probably needs to ensure that fake news are not becoming a big part of the, of the platform and creating uh, side effects. So all of us need to become more responsible. We need guidance, we need support, we need an enabling environment to be responsible. But um, let's, uh, let's not stop uh, technology from solving our problems because it introduces some risk. Said Khalid, Marayak. Mr. Khalid, what do, you be, what do you think about this, especially that with the developments that we are witnessing in terms of technology, the private sector is now selling technology to other countries and uh, to other companies in the private sector, or maybe in small countries, they are uh, maybe selling them um, technology that is related uh, to spying or to surveillance, which used to be actually solely restricted into the intelligence services of some countries. Could this be organized? Could this actually be contained to ensure that they do not go astray? I'm going to, I guess, reiterate what I heard uh, many of the panelists, uh, maybe just latching on to what Mudathar mentioned. We have to balance the risk of technology with the opportunity. And we, uh, you know, this is moving so fast. Technology is moving so fast. You look at, I travel a lot to China, you look at facial recognition. And of course, that has some security usages, but it could also allow you to cross into an airport and check in e much easier. It could allow customer interaction to be much smoother. So. What we in the Kingdom of Bahrain do is that we, and we're working with um, uh, the World Economic Forum and the Fourth Industrial uh, Center for, uh, in, in California, we have a, a, uh, a fellow there, a lady, a woman, who is spending the next year understanding what are the implications of regulation, but how do we also stay ahead of this in terms of understanding the opportunity? So we have to ensure that we're managing risk with opportunity. Um, I'll give you another example. We've introduced in financial technology a sandbox. Much like uh, Omar mentioned in the Reg Lab, but we've done it in financial technology. Uh, we understand, for instance, that crypto, cryptocurrency exchanges, there's a risk, but there's an opportunity. And in that sandbox, we allow companies to test their product for nine months. Central Bank of Bahrain has been very forward thinking. And then after those nine months are complete, they allow them to potentially graduate to the formal rule book. We cannot be, we cannot close ourselves off to the world. I think it would be detrimental to the Middle East if we ignore what technology has to offer. Not just for the technology in its sake, but for the jobs. Ultimately, all of us in the Middle East need to create jobs. And these jobs are gonna come in, in the future as engineers, coders, data scientists. So unless we adopt these technologies, make sure that we have, like Karim, homegrown startups that emerge from this. That's how we're going to ultimately make sure that technology is not just technology for its own sake, but also for job creation. So we, of course, have to manage risk, but we have to not ignore opportunity. We will take a short break now, just for commercial purposes. Uh, we will discuss after the break the issue of uh, ethical challenges that we, we, we see in the fourth industrial revolution. 
مشاهدي العربية إذا نأخذ وقفة مع فاصل نتابع بعد We will take uh, an advertising break uh, and after that uh, we will be continuing our discussion in the World Economic Forum and the Dead Sea. Then <clears throat> it's a very short break, I promise. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back uh, to this uh, session organized by uh, Al Arabiya and the World Economic Forum of the Dead Sea, uh, speaking about uh, the opportunities and risks of the fourth industrial uh, revolution. We were discussing security issues as well as confidentiality issues. So let us discuss now ethical issues uh, with Wafa, uh, you know that we have a lot of challenges uh, uh, like, for example, uh, uh, genetic uh, engineering, uh, the CRISPR uh, technique uh, used, uh, and uh, we know that uh, the same technique uh, could cure uh, diseases and at the same time could create this uh, superhuman uh, being. Uh, so uh, how will we deal? with this uh, new technology. Engineering, I would like to go back very briefly to some a few of the points that my co-panelists have made. Um, at the very heart and foundation of the internet is that it is an open, interoperable, and it's a space for freedom. And uh, if we start to reduce and close the civil society space or civic space generally online, then that's actually how we close ourselves off to the rest of the world. Um, I would have to disagree with my fellow panelists from Karim, unfortunately, but I do think that there are some technologies that we cannot welcome. And uh, that is based, I mean, I mean, there are several of them. It's not even just technologies, it's maybe mechanisms of, of doing certain uh, technologies. Uh, but luckily we have international human rights standards. And that's something that I think has been more or less lacking from this conversation because um, ethics is one thing but human rights are another, and states are obliged to comply with these human rights standards. And we also have the UN guiding principles on business and human rights that are not binding, but they also provide a lot of guidance for how business uh, should uh, provide services in a way that, that protects users. Um, I also think that uh, in terms of airport check-ins, usually it saves you about 15 extra seconds. But are you willing to give up every single point on your face for facial recognition to have it stored somewhere and save 15 seconds of your life. I mean, that's, uh, uh, I think it's a judgment call for users to make, but um, it's really, this is what I mean when I say responsible technology. I mean that the technology is being uh, deployed in a way that makes sense for the user and that, that does not put the user at risk of having their data be abused. I know we all have the best of intentions, but it's not up to us if our data is hacked or not. Uh, so. And to answer your question about uh, genetic engineering, um, I, I think genetic engineering and cha CRISPR should be banned. I mean, uh, you ask me as a person, but I think we still need, I mean, I'll answer you as a, as a policy person, it, I think it, we still need to develop regulation around that, and, and we still need to develop uh, guidelines for how we can uh, engage in these kinds of practices. We, we asked also on Twitter about this uh, issue. سألنا إذا على تويتر سؤال. We have uh, raised a question uh, on Twitter uh, about uh, genetic engineering. Do you support it uh, regardless of religious and ethical issues? Uh, and we noticed uh, that we have uh, a great uh, discrepancy. 39% uh, said yes, uh, but 43% uh, said no. The UAE had a genome project. What are the rules and regulations that could uh, uh, put a framework for genetic engineering? But, uh, you can answer that too. I'll answer that briefly and then go to the genomics part. I think just commenting on what Mudathar said and, and commenting on the stigma that's associated with killer robots, Nine out of ten articles that I read are on how killer robots are coming and they're nearing and the Terminator scenario is happening. And um, I tend to see these articles and feel like we're living in a world where um, 
news is on, it, it, goes, it goes viral depending on how scared it makes a, people, a person feel, rather than how accurate it is. The news that we're seeing is, is very subjective, and we, it's about how many clicks we can generate. Today, with regards to killer robots, I believe that the dangers in the short term from biotech far, 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 far outweigh any dangers from killer robots. Because for less than $100, the person can buy a kit and uh, alter smallpox or alter one of the diseases in their backyard and create a disease that cannot be traced back to him or her, that can spread globally, cross borders, and kill hundreds of millions of people. This exists today. I'm not talking about 20 years down the line. The risk of that and the barrier to entry for that is much higher than a killer robot that's going to cost 200 million to develop and can only operate for half an hour because the batteries are not really that uh, efficient and you know can only operate in one specific geography at a certain point of time. So uh, I think that we need to think about these technologies in a very realistic manner and not focus on one specific technology or one specific impact. With regards to genomics and uh, genetics engineering and all of that, in the UAE we believe that there's a lot of promise that comes with sequencing genomes. Um, the promise is that we'll be able to solve certain health issues, cure certain diseases, and the only way we can do that is through exploring genomics. So we need to do that in general. If we don't do it, someone else will. But what we can, what we can promise or what we can do is we can try to anonymize the data as much as possible to ensure that we are focusing on the science rather than on the person. And that's our effort, and that's what we're focusing on. We haven't perfected it yet, but what we uh, are doing as an approach is we're trying to welcome every single person that's working in this domain to come and share with us how they would do it best. And then through the Reg Lab, through our accelerator programs, actually do a POC to try to understand how do we ensure that privacy is not affected, but the promise of this technology is realized. Um. Murad, when it comes to ethical issues, uh, some countries uh, like uh, European countries uh, have uh, published uh, an ethical code for uh, uh, private companies like Google and Facebook. Uh, so they are trying to establish uh, these uh, entities uh, in order to develop uh, algorithms uh, that will uh, let us know in the future who will be taking a loan, who will be uh, registering in university, yet the problem is that uh, these uh, centers uh, um, are not uh, uh, representative uh, of all uh, communities, uh, especially women. So are we creating uh, additional uh, this, uh, discrepancy and the lack of justice? Um, this issue is not new. If you look at before I answer that question, I want to disagree with Wafa, who disagreed with Mudassar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of facial recognition, I just looked up the UN um, Refugee Agency, UNHCR. There are 20 people are newly displaced every minute of the day, and there are 65.6 .6 million people displaced refugees. They don't have any papers, they don't have ID. And if you're not recognized, you don't get anything. And facial recognition will allow us, technologies like that, to give them the rights as a human being. So it's not just 15 seconds at the airport, it's the, if you're one of those displaced people, it means life and death. So it has a lot of potential. Yes, you know, 15 seconds at the airport is an additional benefit, so I disagree with you that it's not just for the privileged few. Uh, if you look at the ethics issue, Lara, thanks to electricity, we're having this discussion. Thanks to electricity, we have connectivity, et cetera. But when its uh, electricity was adopted in the U.S. in late 19th, early 20th century, factories caught on fire. And, um, and they couldn't use it. And insurance companies got fed up and they launched uh, the underwriter laboratories that took the technology called circuit breaker and came up with a standard protocol and turned to the factories and said, if you do not implement the underwriter laboratories, UL certified circuit breakers, we're not going to insure you. Thanks to that, we're all here and benefiting from electricity. There are different, similar approaches to we can take about algorithms. You cannot legislate ethics. It's value system. And if you look at the AI machine learning developments, it's called black box algorithms. The algorithms are derived from the data. So how do we make sure that the algorithms are ethical when a person is not writing the code? Number one is make sure that the data 
is representative, it's not biased. It's, uh, we talked about oil, but uh, Omar told us the difference between Venezuelan oil and the Middle East oil, the sweet. Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? So yeah, <laughs> quality data is Quality sweet, data, sweet quality crude. is sweet crude is what we want <laughs> in the data. Um, the second area is um, looking at the transparency of the algorithms, and I talked to OpenAI guys, and they said we'll solve that in the next two to three years. Until then, <coughs> we can come up, and that's the area we're working on, is to develop an ethics switch, similar to Circuit Breaker, that can be embedded in these devices that reflects the value system of the countries, because we cannot impose each other values. And when and if we, and hopefully, inshallah, will reach, have that common uh, AI ethical principles, then we can push it down. Uh, Modasser, before uh, going back to you, you were with us at the beginning of this week in Arabia, and we held an interview about uh, the uh, Uber uh, um, agreement. Uh, so we congratulate you, and uh, we will be uh, viewing uh, this uh, video now. Yet, uh, this is a third uh, survey uh, that uh, we have implemented. Uh, what is uh, the thing that uh, scares you the most uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence? And the majority of the respondents uh, spoke about uh, losing job opportunities, 45%. Uh, uh, I hope that we will be able to show uh, a video about our interview with Mudasser in Arabia. Of delivering impact. <laughs> And as we looked at ourselves almost a year ago and said, this is how far we have come. We've created a million jobs in the region. What's the next phase for Kareem? We realized that we're just getting started. So you have created one million jobs in the region uh, during this very brief period of time. This is a great uh, accomplishment, uh, yet we know that uh, uh, within uh, a few years uh, we will have uh, autonomous cars. So what will happen uh, for those? Yeah, it's, it's a great uh, question and, and, and one that, um, that we... Um, think quite a bit about uh, because the, the purpose of Kareem and the reason we started Kareem was to simplify the lives of people in the region and build an awesome organization that inspires. So simplifying the lives of people is core to our purpose. And, and we call the people that, that drive for us captains as a sign of respect. These are the people that have helped us build Kareem and that have helped build this infrastructure um, that has simplified the lives of so many people. So, so their, their welfare, their prosperity, and their families are super, super important to us. And two perspectives on this uh, topic of autonomous. Number one, it is going to happen at some point, whether it takes 10 years, it takes 15 years, it takes 20 years. It might take a little bit longer in our region because of the cost arbitrage. It's a little bit, uh, labor is a little bit cheaper. It might take a little bit longer in some parts of our region due to the way traffic works, but it is going to happen at some point. A few so, years longer? few years, it's anyone's guess at this point, right? Um, but just to give you one data point on that, in the US, the cost of a driver uh, as a percent of the cost of a trip is 80%. That percent in this region is 25%. So the technology, autonomous technology, will have to become a lot more affordable before it can economically start replacing humans. And if you've been to Cairo or Karachi or Lahore, you can also see the traffic in three lanes. We have six, dr six cars driving. So the technology has a slightly higher burden on uh, accuracy uh, for it to make sense in our markets. So it will take some more time, but it is going to happen. And, and I think the, the only answer to this is we really need to spend um, and invest in the education of our people. Uh, we need to make sure that we are upscaling our populations uh, at large and, and equipping them for this fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the people will not just be displaced through autonomous driving, but there'll be many other things uh, that will displace people. And it is our responsibility to make sure that that upskilling happens much, much faster uh, and happens at scale. And I actually believe that we can use technology as a way to assist this upskilling as well. You know, a lot of the developed world built a fairly sophisticated education infrastructure. There are schools, there are colleges, there are universities that cater to almost all of their populations. But if you look at our region, 
we didn't build enough schools, we didn't build enough colleges, and even if we build them, we didn't build them of the highest quality. Now, with technology, with the internet, we should be able to figure out how to impart quality education much faster, much more affordably through online education. If we have one qualified professor, that qualified professor can serve a lot more people today with technology that's available than was the case in the past. Okay. So the only answer to this autonomous and displacing people is to put this at the top of our priority list and make sure that we're starting to drive this agenda from the very highest levels. Thank you, Modasir. Let's take, we have a few minutes left. Uh, let's take uh, some questions from the audience, please. I would kindly ask you to, to give short answers. Um, Hazem Galal from PwC. We've got two great examples of governments that are enabling regulators here in the region. But I wanted to hear from the panel, uh, what are their thoughts on some of the other countries in the region that are still in the third industrial revolution, thinking about automation and how can we make sure we're not a two-speed region? Anybody who would like to take it. Who would like to answer that? Let me, uh, let me take one perspective on this one. You know, what, what at least we have seen uh, happen to some extent is the lack of traditional, the, the presence of traditional infrastructure actually blocks new technologies from coming in. If you look at Europe and ride hailing, Europe built sophisticated transport infrastructure and that actually became a barrier to the adoption of ride hailing. So I would even argue, and some people find that controversial, is that the transportation infrastructure today in Cairo with the likes of Kareem and Uber being available anywhere in Cairo for three minutes, it's probably superior to one in Paris and London. So technology can actually move a lot faster if there is a void that it can fill versus there is existing infrastructure that can block. So we may realize and we may find out and pleasantly surprised that some of the have nots in our region actually might benefit from technology even greater because there is a void to fill versus existing infrastructure and encumbrance that come in the way. Yeah, if I can address that as well, I, I think, you know, I think larger countries, Egypt, um, ones with larger populations, I can understand the challenges of introducing technology or moving as fast as smaller countries. So I, I believe that the responsibility of smaller countries is to pilot and be agile and illustrate the benefits. And we see that. We see Many countries come visit Bahrain to understand how we introduced certain technologies, how we developed regulation. I think governments are trying to move very quickly. I'm very optimistic when I see visits from uh, other larger countries in terms of how they're trying to adapt to technology. So while uh, obviously it's more of a challenge to implement the same regulation in Egypt as it would be to Bahrain, uh, we're willing to share. We believe in collaboration and uh, we welcome governments to come visit us and understand how we've implemented regulation. And then they can obviously take comfort that we've done it and they can uh, mimic. Thank you, Sayyid Khaled. Uh, uh, we take a second question. Uh, go ahead, ma'am, please. Please present yourself. Sure. Perhaps to the policymakers, I was wondering if you could speak to the value of education and encouraging um, uptaking education in um, artificial intelligence and especially encouraging girls because uh, we recently uh, had a recruitment process in the region for a scholarship for AI um, in partnership with the Montreal Institute for Artificial Intelligence and we received 100 applicants and three of them were girls. And what we found was that um, technology is a great equalizer, right? Like you, you can, Technology doesn't care if you're black or white or a hijab or not, right? You can, you can do that from anywhere. You can work from home. So I think that it has a great potential moving forward. So I was wondering if you if you'd like to address that. Thank you. Uh, Your Excellency, can you tell us about the coding classes uh, in the Emirates? Yeah, I think we should encourage boys to uh, go to these uh, classes because <laughs> we actually ran a um, uh, small test, uh, I would say, uh, proof of concept. We did something called the AI summer camp last summer to see how many kids from the schools across the country can we get interested in artificial intelligence, introduce artificial intelligence to, and then give them basic coding principles when it comes to AI. Um, I honestly was expecting to have 100 uh, students uh, attend these, these classes and most of them to be boys. We had over 5,000 and uh, around 70% were girls. 
So it was incredible. It represents the hunger that we have uh, in the Middle East, and I think it represents the broader region, hopefully. Uh, what we're doing in the UAE is we want to get everyone to be a part of this future, and we want them to understand the impact of AI in the right manner. So we're doing multiple programs. One is this AI camp. We expanded it to be year long. And we have different camps. We have a camp actually ongoing right now on data science uh, at this given moment uh, across the country. And we're aiming hopefully by the end of the year to have more than 15,000 students that go through this program. We're also deploying AI within our educational curriculum, focused uh, first and foremost in the primary uh, phase on ethics because we want to ensure that students have a very strong ethical compass when it comes to developing these technologies, to engaging with these technologies, and to working with these technologies in the future. And then moving from grade five onwards to understanding how to shape this technology and how this technology is going to shape their jobs, how this technology is going to shape their future, and how they can be a part of this future. So I hope this answers your question. Um, uh, we're out of time, unfortunately. We will be able to continue our discussion uh, outside uh, this room. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, debate, uh, for your interesting questions, and for your presence. Uh, so uh, we conclude uh, this uh, session about the fourth uh, industrial revolution from the WEF.C. Thank you for being with us.